Hey everybody, it's Richard Harrison Scott Lees here with another episode of the Surf and Sales podcast, also subtitled as the Lord of the Flies, as Scott's children are literally tearing up the house. <laughs> Mine probably are too. Uh, we are super excited today to have with us Dr. Richard Condi, who is an associate professor at the University of Houston downtown. Um, and what, aside from the fact that he's got a PhD and he's a doctor, it's in sales. So literally, this is one of those people where, you know, most of us don't decide to go to college and say, hey, I'm going to go to sales. So not only did Richard figure it out, he decided to take it as far as he can. Uh, so Richard, thank you so much for coming on board. Thanks for having me. I look forward to the, to the conversation. Yeah. yeah, I'm really excited to, to talk to you and learn about sales in academia and why is it taking so long for sales to even become a part of academia? All this kind of stuff. So, how did you first get involved with uh, with sales and and selling? Well, I used to be in charge of inside sales centers. So I started off mostly in the financial services area. I was with um, Travelers Insurance and moved to Nationwide. A Nationwide, I led about almost a 400 uh, person seat of inbound and outbound sales individuals in three centers. And uh, so really the love of inside sales for me came from the balancing of all the operational stuff with selling. And to me, I think that's really a, a bigger art than people who focus on outside sales. That's sort of my bias because I think it's more complicated to be an inside sales person versus outside. Can you tell, tell, can you tell us why? Expand on that. We, Richard well, and I are grinning because we agree with you, but I, I want to hear your explanation as to why inside sales is... Um, you know, more complicated than outside selling? Well, I think because of the operational requirements. So every moment of an inside person's day is recorded, captured, and measured in some way, which that adds a, a layer of scrutiny that you don't really find with outside sales. And then you're, you're able to be coached in the moment. So your supervisor or manager can be there with you. He or she can coach you. There's always involvement. There's always measurements. Everything you do and say is watched in some manner. And then you also have to sell. And balancing all that is really, really difficult. And I think that's why it's more uh, difficult to be inside versus outside sales. If it's, if it's more difficult, why have traditionally, I think now it's very different, right? But why have for the last, you know, several decades, inside sales was sort of seen as, you know, the lesser of the two. They were seen as sort of telemarketers. They weren't seen as savvy. They weren't, you know, they weren't, you know, you know, they just didn't measure up. Why, why do you think that was if this was more complicated? I think it all starts with the bias of why inside sales was created. I think initially it was created for an expense play. And really it is an expense play to a certain degree. And the individuals who created inside sales sort of said, hey, that's a stepchild. They'll do lesser size deals. They are more call center, if you will, where the, the better salespeople are outside because they're dealing with people, meeting with people. They have this face-to-face -face interaction. So I think the people who create inside sales had the built-in bias that individuals who did that job were not quite up to the skill set of an outside salesperson. Uh, when actually it's sort of, I think, opposite. Do you think that, do you think that part of it was hey, let's take these parts of the sales process and move them inside, which then means they don't have to be seen in front of other people. They're doing tedious work or less than, you know, what they considered hard work. When in reality, all along, it was way harder and it's been harder. And, and to a certain extent, it's my belief that oftentimes inside salespeople, not always, but a lot of times tend to be um, more sales savvy because they do get that coaching that you're talking about. They are learning from their peer who's sitting next to them. They can debrief over lunch or something like that. Is, is that what you're seeing as well? I think that's a great, great point. Uh, one of my current MBA students, she uh, works for a major credit card company. And of course with COVID, they moved all their outside sales operations inside. Well, she came from an inside sales background and she was telling me how she's been able to be more successful than her peers 
because she has that foundation, being able to talk on the phone and do all the things that salespeople do without having the need to do face to face. And she's, I mean, she's doing really well right now. And she attributes a lot of success to her inside sales foundation. Where did you, where did your, even before the call center stuff, where did your desire for selling come in? Were you the competitive kid playing sports? Were you always having a little bit of a hustle in school and trying to make a little money? Like, where did it all come from even before your, your gigs, you know, running big? Yeah, I mean, I think it all started from all the above. I've always been sort of a hustler and trying to find angles and entrepreneur at heart. I've had a couple of businesses. I'm even, you know, I do consulting now and I do research. So in addition to my uh, professor type job, so I'm always, I was like selling and, but for me really it becomes for the love of people. I'm fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by understanding how people think, react, what makes them tick. And I think that's really a foundation of most great salespeople is really the human connection and behavioral understanding. I've always been fascinated by the human nature and I think that's one of the reasons I was successful as a leader because I, I'm fascinated by people. I like to learn about people. And that desire has always fueled me. And, you know, early on in my life, I didn't, I didn't do sales jobs. And I said, you should, you should get into sales. And I was always sort of weary of the whole commission uh, compensation structure. Uh, but I think basically my love for people, understanding people, that's where my desire has, has really emerged in sales and, when I started leading inside sales teams, I was really able to match my strong like operational sense with that people development, people understanding, and, and, and really listen to what a customer says to sell them what they actually need and want, not pushing things that are a waste of time. I wanna, I wanna steer this conversation towards the academic side of things, because this, this is my like, big interest in, in speaking with, with someone like you. So why has it taken so long for sales courses to even become offered as any part of academia whatsoever, let alone the focus of a major or a doctoral degree? What, what, why has it taken so long for sales to get any kind of respect whatsoever? Well, I think if you look at most of the uh, sales departments or they're not in major universities. Or, oh, that's correct. There, there's barely any even now, right? Yeah. That's about, that's about, but there are, there's like 160 or something like that. Right, yeah, almost 200. Right. Uh, so I think is A, because a lot of the big, uh, big universities, high them universities, did not want to establish them for research academic reasons or even for individuals who offer money. I heard a story once that the University of Texas um, someone approached the dean of that university and said, hey, I'll give you X amount of dollars if you start a sales program. And the dean said, hey, this is the University of Texas. We don't teach sales here. Um, well, why, so, well, why? why? Why has that attitude been so prevalent? That, that hits home, obviously, for me since I live in Austin. And this is like, you know, <laughs> our, our dean. I don't know when this was. But at any rate, like, why, is, why does that guy have that attitude? Why is it, why is it that way? Well, I think that um, marketing has really been more consumer-based, consumer consumer behavior-focused. There's a lot of research dollars around how people buy and where they buy. And I think the uh, pecking order of sales has been toward the end, to the lower end of that, of that spectrum. Um, and a lot of the smaller schools have fulfilled the, open, the, the opportunities and, and found niches. And I think that's the main reason why is that the big schools haven't really pushed it. So, so, some of, so some of the smaller schools are kind of, you know, picking up the slack or, or maybe, you know, just starting the kind of movement, let's just say, to get, get sales to be more predominant. I think actually. they see the opportunity. I think they yeah. see the opportunity. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's funny because it, it's funny because these big schools, they have to sell to the kids. And you're right. It's a marketing play, right? Like, how does the picture look? Do we have, you know, kids looking like they're having fun? They're selling the experience. Right, I read this week that kids are now asking, like, wait a minute, you sold me this whole campus experience that doesn't exist. I want some money back. You aren't able to deliver on that, right? So there's, there's been, a, I think I saw a lawsuit coming out for that. Um, and then, of course, they have to go to the alumni, right? And they put no effort into teaching the people who smile and dial for alumni dollars to sell. 
I get the calls from U of A all the time, right? I don't know. I mean, I think I haven't gotten Scott's calls from ASU, but I'm sure that, you know, ours are equally bad in that case. Yeah, well, they're not, they're not training any, any of those, those people to do that. And, and I, I can't remember the statistic now, but like an overwhelming num of, you know, new college graduates go into sales in some capacity. Yeah, it's like 60, 70 percent. Actually, yeah, when you graduate, huge. there's some sort of sales. It's huge. It's a huge number. It is huge. It's a huge number. I agree. So, so if somebody is going to go to, um, you know, UH downtown or some of the other schools that, that are offering, um, you know, sales courses and maybe specializations and whatnot, what is being taught there? That's what I want to know. What, what are some of the basic selling principles that are being taught there is it stuff that's relevant and current to today or are we teaching methodologies from 1980 you guys are putting me in some tough situations here this, uh so i i think that you know for example at uhd we have one of only the only, i think there's only five mba sales programs in the united states we have one of them so what i really focus on is really preparing the MBA sales leader to really understand what's going to happen next in sales, not what already happened. And I think one of the benefits that I have is that it wasn't very long ago. I was leading teams, right? And through my consulting work, I work with people and I realized what's happening today. Um, sadly, uh, a lot of my peers don't have that background of experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, it gives you a huge advantage, right? You've been an operator and now an educator. Yeah, or and some of them are only academia, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and, and my students tell me that my feedback, right? I get I have pretty good feedback because I can connect the theory with the with the actual practical work. But I think most universities are doing a pretty good job teaching. There's a lot of sales contests that happen between universities, and they're judged by industry folks. So a lot of people are really showing and detailing, you know, the steps for the selling process. Some do the spin the spin uh, process. Others have different ways. Of teaching it I do think that a lot of what academia is teaching is more from the outside perspective and if you consider the changes that are coming or have already occur with AI with an inside sales focus with the way marketing and sales really are becoming one entity all those things are the present and the future of sales and we need to do a better job teaching our students what's next not what has happened where do you see AI taking us in the next two to three years versus five to 10 years? Because I assume you're paying attention to it a little bit more than I, I am. Yeah, well, I think AI still has a, a lot to go, but it's growing, it's learning, it's learning really fast. That's really fascinating to me. So I think if you think about, for me, two to three years, you know, B, uh, B2C will be more and more automated. It will be more AI-led. Uh, bots will get smarter you'll be able to talk to people and actually speak with a robot or even do it through chat i think within five or so years b2c will be mostly automated right um, the need for individuals in that area will be less and less like what what won't be there like what i mean from the online experience i get it right um and i i you know again even with today you know, the, the retail experience is changing because the retail shopping experience is less about shopping as much as it is just getting out of the house, right? So what, what will be less because there's more AI? Well, I think it'll be less um, inside sales people. So for example, if I look at my whole industry of financial services, right? It's a huge industry, people looking for insurance, for example, right? And they call 800 number and they have people that try to sell them or provide value to them more likely that will not be there, right? You'll deal either with a bot or you'll have tools and information that will walk you through the information process online. Now, Cambridge Analytica, will you agree with it or not? What they really found out is we're very simple individuals. Through a simple personality test, they were able to determine how to target you, right? And that's the other part of sales that I think it's going at a high rate is the ability to really understand your customer at a psychological personality level. So I can present information to you that you want to understand. So for example, I'm a driver. Give me bullet points, get to the point. If anyone tells to me that way, I'm gonna have sort of a better connection because you're not wasting my time. You give me what I want. 
other people might be more expressive and they need to things to be shown a different way. All that information is coming together at the same time to where when you go shopping, uh, whether it be online, they'll be able to know who you are and walk you through the process the way you want to be sold. Um, and then if you call somebody, it'll be a, a bot. I think more complicated sales will go to a human being. Um, so I think that's, and then all the analytics behind it, right? AI will start learning automatically. Machine learning will, will say, hey, today this is what we're seeing. And it will, it will move and change dialogue and information based on real time facts. We need our, our, our CRMs, Richard, are gonna start importing Facebook uh, data. And this is algorithmically gonna spit out a different type of pitch based on who somebody is. So you're gonna alter my pitch to talk to, talk to the doctor who's a driver versus you, who's you know, an influencer or, or, or what have you. That would be, that's a wild, wild universe to, to Well, think. actually, that's happening now. Some companies do that through your LinkedIn profile and other social. There's three or four companies that I know yes, of. for sure, but LinkedIn is arguably like, um, a bit polished it is of what somebody wants to present to the world and you know I don't know I, I'm not hardly using Facebook anymore but like if you went back 20 years and looked at somebody's Facebook history there's a lot of stuff in there that we might want to delete if we haven't already you know done so <laughs> right? but you could argue that that's a better 360 degree picture of maybe who somebody is um, yeah there's a company that alleges that it touches multiple social media platforms to give you your, uh, they do a disc profile. So they'll go through multiple social media profiles and then they boom, spit out this profile. And then they'll also at the same time, give you, give the seller points on how to sell to that person based on the disc profile. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I mean, Crystal knows, yeah, I like that one. I actually, I don't mind that technology, right? I, what freaks me out are the palantirs of the world. Right. That's the, that's the guy who scares me, you know, um, what, what do you see, you know, if, if you are thinking like for people who are like, Oh, I didn't even know I could get a master's. There's only five schools. Right. Obviously we certainly want university of Houston downtown to be, you know, number one on the list, happy to promote it. Um, you're the first one to ever come talk to us. What should, what should, how would I even know what kind of program is good? Right. Like just in general, aside from listening to us and, and, you know, now falling in love with Dr. Condi, you know. Um, <laughs> well, like, I don't what know, Richard's, Richard's son Riley is already starting a business right now during, during quarantine. And, he, and let's just fast forward a few years and he needs to go to school. Why is he gonna go to, you know, UHD instead of, um, you know, some other school that's, that's got sales programs? How, how are they separating, how are you separating yourselves? Well, I mean, I think it's all about the, um, the type of program, the experience they have. So at the undergraduate level, uh, they're part of, um, there's a, I forget the name of the association that really uh, has about 100 universities. We do a lot of, of different contests that bring people together for sales conferences, and they give them a lot of exposure and like real, real time opportunity to do sales pitches. I think that would be important. Also, I would look at placement. So who's placing who, where? what companies are partnering with those universities. I think it speaks a lot about the, the university and also the professor. And I think also for the MBA program is who's teaching it, where you've been placed, contacts, people being promoted. You know, so far my, my sales cohort, we've had, I think is like a 60% promotion rate. Now, some of that's due to the market, but also I think we have really good people who have grown. Uh, so I think that's kind of two or three things I would look at if I'm choosing on the program. How, how are, what is the split between like salesmanship and the craft of selling versus the education people might receive in terms of sales leadership and sales management? I think most undergraduate programs have a component of each. They'll have a sales and they also have a sales leadership uh, component as well. Uh, for me, MBA, I really, focus more on critical thinking skills, strategic, how are these individuals going to lead an organization as executives? Uh, so it's a little different uh, conversation that I have with them and um, exposure that they have. But most sales programs have 
a bit of how do you sell and how to be a sales uh, manager. Mm -hmm. Is it, what, how would you make a case to somebody, you know, like us that is established in our career or maybe people a little younger than us who have done some selling, but, um, you know, have, have like a inclination to maybe go back to school. How, how would you, how would you get somebody to, to agree? Yeah, you should go back to school and get an MBA in, in sales. I can remember years ago, maybe I was like in my early thirties or something like that. And I was in between jobs for a moment and I'm like, maybe I'll go get, you know, a master's degree or an MBA. And I remember my father-in-law telling me that I was absolutely fucking crazy for thinking that, like, why would you want to do that? You, it makes no sense. You go backwards in your career, your earning power will slow down, blah, 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 blah. Why would somebody go back to school to go study sales? I can totally understand it from an 18 to 22 year old undergrad perspective. And even maybe you go straight away from undergrad to get the MBA, but what about, why would somebody go back? And get All right. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to, Answer that in a second, but I'm gonna give you the foundation why I think it's important. Uh, one of the things that I've found is there's, there's a huge disconnect with what research knows, what the industry does. And there's three key areas that are very relevant where industry and, and academia should party together to do things better. And then, I'll, then I think you'll see why I'm saying sure, why sure. you go back. Number yeah. one yeah, is compensation, right? The way sales people work is comp compensated has been irrelevant for the last five or six decades. Um, I don't know any other profession or business that would have the same mediocre results and you keep doing the same thing. Sales does it, right? And the research really highlights that the way people are compensated, it's not, doesn't promote what I consider to be a holistic view of what performance is. Now, if you wanna measure performance by only revenue, keep doing what you're doing, but components of the job are more complicated than just your revenue. So I think having the awareness that there needs to be something different and the ability to think beyond what you know. And that stems from the fact that in sales, we promote good salespeople, right? So be people sort of in that league do the same thing over and over. There was an amazing study done that which every sales leader should read. It's academic, it's very scientific, it's very statistical. But this uh, three professors secured 53,000 records of employees for over a six year period. And what they found is companies promoted good salespeople to leaders. Um, that practice uh, decreased subordinates' performance by 30%. So we keep doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. And the third thing is, is the importance of bringing the right motivation to the job because sales is very extrinsically motivated. Everything's measured, everything is, is to the point where it, does, it doesn't bring long-term results. So the reason I would encourage anyone to take an MBA in sales, maybe my program, is because you're able to think beyond the status quo because if you believe that sales is been done well for the last 50 years, then you're okay with 30, 40% attrition for the last 30, 40 years. You're okay with 20% of the people selling 80% of the, of, the, of the product for the last 20, 30, 40 years. So you need to think differently. You need a different perspective. You need to challenge and be courageous. And the way you do that is having different exposures. In sales organizations, I learned what Bobby did. Bobby learned what Mary did. Mary learned what Tammy did. And you sort of pass it down. We kind of change the paradigm because again, if you look at the results of sales for the last five or six decades, they've been consistently the same. We need to go back to school, Richard. We need to go back to school. Rewind, rewind the clock. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I can do that. So I don't know. I, I heard Dr. Condi's you know, pretty good, but I don't know if I could handle it. So, uh, so, so question for you. And this goes back to, I think, what you're saying. Um, for the, you know, the average VP of sales is barely making it 18 months, right? And is that, you know, why is that? Is it, you know, I have my belief that, that it's, you know, the CEOs and the founders don't understand sales in most cases unless they came through that realm. Um, or that it just seems like an easy thing to target when the number doesn't go the right way. 
Um, but marketing doesn't have an 18 month thing. Head of engineering doesn't have an 18 month life cycle. Like, why are we stuck? I think one reason is how do you define success, right? If we define success by the revenue, then it's a pretty easy decision, right? I need 10 widgets. You got me eight widgets. I need to, someone else can give me 10 widgets, right? But the success of sales is beyond that. The success of the end is the number of widgets. How many times did the people bought the widgets bought from you again? How satisfied are they? How's your profitability? Are your employees retaining, right? A lot of, one of the big decisions to have with inside sales is the, the basic success of the inside sales, one side of the equation, which is the sales portion of it. When you include the loss of turnover into the equation, then it becomes a different calculation, right? So I think it's really easy to measure sales but one little sliver of metrics when it's a more complex outcome that you have to consider. And sadly, we base everything on, on the results in the short term. And unfortunately, that's not a good business mentality from my perspective. So what, because I, I think there's, and maybe you know them, and if you do, you know, please share, but are there any, like the first report that you, that you talked about where they looked at 50,000 people, do you know the name of that report? Are there any reports that you know of or data or research so that we can arm these heads of sales to say, hey, yes, this is it. But here's what legitimate academic research is telling us that you can make that decision, but it's not the right decision. Because I think sometimes yeah. it, it does come down to that leader. Yeah, you're 100 percent and having different information. So there is a ton of academic research. The challenge is in the United States, the two do not meet. Right. There isn't a, a mechanism to say, hey, I'm a researcher, this is what I found. And quite frankly, most of you know, me and my peers, you don't talk uh, industry, right? You're talking about constructs and, you know, and, and, and this, this statistics and that statistic and CFAs and all the stuff, you know, some things we are not uh, spoken about. So when you're talking about that, it's like, what is this person talking about? But there needs to be a mechanism to bring really good research with industry and say this is what we found let's let's test this farther in your business like if i was the ceo of a, of a company i would have a whole department that's nothing but test and learn and i would do really good research to understand what works and what doesn't work a lot of different experiments and i would have the discipline to keep doing it because that way it would shape the way i would i would move my the culture of my company uh, but I think it's really about awareness. It's about connecting people. It's about people speaking the same language. It's about making it a win-win so everybody can succeed together and learn and be better. But that doesn't exist. I mean, the the article that uh, that I referenced earlier, it is an amazing article, but to read it is very stats heavy. I mean, I had to read it like three times to really get it because the statistic they used was really fast. I mean, it was beyond probably my level, I'll be honest with you. But it was so, I mean, they thought about everything. They measured everything. It was so well constructed and it was based on actual real data, right? Sometimes. A little different, a little different than the A-B tests that occur in most uh, startup sales organizations, which is like, I'm going to make 15 calls using this pitch here and 15 calls using that other pitch over there. And then Correct. pick this one. This is the one that works. We know for sure, right? Yeah. Yeah. The part of it, frankly, is all these companies want to sell stuff, right? So you have, a, let's say, a software company that says, hey, 80% of our people who use this uh, sold 10% more. Well, they have like, the, they use the 10 people that actually did it, not the other 100. And, um, but I get it. They're trying to sell, but it doesn't help the industry as a whole when we have all these half truths. Where do you, where do you see um the outside sales role going do you see it starting to disappear over time and everybody oh, becomes, right now I mean, I, that's what i think i've been saying it for since before scott was born is, so, it, um, is it is it gone for good now maybe is it gone for good is this the, uh, no it's a good question but it is gone i mean i think um what was the uh who, someone did a nice research that between 2015 and 2020 there'll be a million less outside sales jobs and it's eventually going to go away, right? This, but we still have a lot of biases on the value of seeing you and touching and feeling and shaking hands. 
But, you know, <laughs> this pandemic probably has changed all of that as well. But, yeah, you, you're starting to see people feel more comfortable selling upstream. You know, as you guys know, there are million dollars deal done every single day without you meeting anybody. And that's just become more of a commonplace. Oh, and by the way, us as consumers, 90% of the research is done before we even engage in the selling process. Technology has given us the power as consumers so we can control the flow of information. We can control the sales process. And that's going to continue to even move, move more upstream. So I do believe that outside sales role would diminish as time goes by. And um, don't, don't you think that that comment about, you know, people have more research before they engage a salesperson, that only applies in an inbound sales environment. I don't necessarily believe that in an outbound sales world. Yeah, I mean, I think if someone's trying to reach out to me, yeah, sometimes I think the argument is like the advantage of outbound is, hey, that person doesn't know that we exist. That's another product that we need. And I get that uh, adage, but I think smart business people are always thinking, hey, I, I understand this happens and, and, and we need to do that. Research it for me. What's available? Who are the vendors? I see your point, but I also know a lot of people who are very proactive in analyzing the business and determining what's needed and the research vendors or opportunities to help fill those needs. What, what, does anything scare you in the sales world? Like, is anything like, you know, you know, it's, it's one thing you can think about certain jobs have just been eliminated, right? The, the, you know, good, bad, or otherwise the coal industry, those jobs are, you know, we don't, we aren't using coal as much, right? Do you see something like that even happening to sales as the AI continues to pick up? Like, are we, are we going to become dinosaurs too? I think there's a sector will be become dinosaurs, but I'll be honest with you, what scares me most about sales, and this sounds sort of bad, is the number of really bad sales leaders. It is fascinating to me that just because you sold something, you have the skill set to lead somebody. Um, I got into a big discussion at a conference with somebody, and you know, they were a top salesperson, now they're a manager. Yeah, that could be the exception. But if you really think about the great um, athletic teams, there is no Peter Principle in athletics. Because generally, if you think about the greatest coaches of all time, none of them were really good players. It's a different skill set to lead versus do. And to me, I think that's the biggest issue with sales is the number of bad sales leaders that yeah. we have. I mean, often in sports, <clears throat> it was never the superstar, never even the um, kind of second or third option. It was always the really solid, reliable, smart player, right? <clears throat> who was just a contributor and who was good culturally and, and keeping team together and whatnot. You know, Phil Jackson was that kind of player in the NBA. Steve Kerr was that kind of player in the NBA. There's a really great book on this, um, since you bring it up, Doctor, called The Captain Class that you might want to read about. And it's, it, it is all about different sports dynasties across all the sports, across, across all the globe, um, and the common thread that made them uh, a dynasty. And that was the captain, not the coach, but the captain of the team. And the captain of the team was never, ever the best player. It was always somebody else who just did their job, kept everybody in line, kept everybody on process and so forth. Um, so I love, I love that uh, example and analogy, and I, I fully, fully agree with it. But I don't know how you change it. I mean, that's such a deep ingrained in culture that if you're a great salesperson, you're a great sales leader. And I think it's, you know, this, this article, you know, showed 30% decrease in revenue, but it has caused so much damage to sales organizations. What are you, on the flip side, you know, you don't, don't wanna make it doom and gloom. What are you excited about? What, what makes you excited about the sales profession? You know what I think is, is the, the data part of it and really analyzing, using data to make really great decisions. And how do you maximize information with action? And I think, again, that's gonna take a, a different level of thinker to be able to to be able to mine those together because right now, like they say, data is the new, uh, the new oil, right? It's the currency of the 20, 2020s. 
and to me, there is so much great information out there, not only how to motivate and, and make your sales team better, but also how to identify your customers better, how to minimize processes to get things, uh, product to, to the market sooner. And it's so exciting because there's so much of it. Uh, we just need to have the right people mine it and even better people identifying what needs to be done. I think that's the exciting thing about sales and leadership is individuals who can see through the data and know what questions to ask are going to be ultra successful. How do you balance this, you know, particularly in the startup world uh, where Scott and I spend so much time, you know, it's sort of like if you're not first, you're last, right? Get there first, get there faster uh, and you'll win. But now to bring in this data approach for some, it, it feels like it could actually slow things down, you know, to, to making quick decisions, but in the long tail, it, it makes more sense. How do you help other people, people who are listening, how do you help them balance that? Like, what is a good amount of data? Where is analysis? Where does paralysis from analysis come in? Have you, have you experienced or seen that for folks? Yeah. And I think it really goes back to the culture of the place. Right, and I know more startups want to move quickly, but I, but where, where is the the sort of the broader perspective of the product, the outcome that you want to have, and really it's about having that that courage and having those conversations and really providing psychological psychological safety net for individuals to be open and have the dialogue and exchange of ideas. Uh, yeah, there's the basic what I, what I find a lot in sales is people look at the conversion rates, not what I call the correlation rates. But that is, for example, you know, if you make 10 calls, you get five appointments, you get two showings, you sell one policy, right? So that, that funnel. But of the, what if the five appointments you receive all were from Austin, Texas, right? You should focus on Austin, Texas, not look at the five, but the five in Austin, Texas, as a silly example. But a lot of people don't correlate and go two or three levels deeper into the data to see what correlates with, with what outcome. So I think it's about asking the right questions. I think, you know, if, if you're helping someone do that is pushing people beyond their, their, their comfort zone to what they know and just keep asking what correlates, you know, simple correlation analysis can open up a, a ton of information for individual companies. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I ran a, a call center a long time ago and we sold newspaper subscriptions and for whatever reason, and we did this, like we looked at days of the week, times of the week, what time people picked up the phone. In all play in Reno, Nevada, between 11 and 12 had the highest pickup rate. As a yeah. sales leader, I would have never even tried to attempt to call them. Like, why would I ever? Nobody's at home. They're at work. They're not, you know. But the data told us these are the times of day to call. And more statistically, I think it was like Tuesdays and Fridays. And we yeah. don't know if it was some shift worker thing where someone was working at something and that's just when the shift change was or whatever. But I totally, I, I love the fact that you're bringing up correlation because I think that's a huge piece. So Yeah, you know, if you're a startup, you, you have to have discipline, which is hard because you want instant results. But again, how do you define success? Is success about the revenue today so I can flip the company tomorrow, then do what you need to do. But if you look at long-term success, you may need to have different tactics. What advice do you give to people who are thinking about a career in sales? Just sort of even sort of coming way back. We've gotten really deep, but coming back out, right? Or maybe this is a better one. What advice do you give to people who are struggling right now in sales, right? Where it, it's May the 5th, yeah, May the 5th, uh, 2020. Um, clearly, a lot of people have been laid off um, or they're concerned about being laid off. You know, what kind of hope can we give them in terms of from yeah. your perspective? Well, I think sales is really easy. It's about people, right? And I think if you have really good salespeople, in my opinion, are not so focused about how much money they're going to make today. They're not focused about the revenue. They're focused on how they can help and serve others to be and provide the service. And again, every, every interaction is a sales opportunity, not to line your pocketbooks, but to help others accomplish something. So I think it's a paradigm shift in your approach to think about how do I help the other person? It may, not, it may not come back to me today, but it will come back eventually. And having the patience to go through it. And if, if you're thinking about career in sales, I, I would encourage you if you want to be happy and successful, is think about how you benefit others first prior to benefiting yourself. But most people don't do it that way because we have been sold 
that sales is all about making a buck and sales will make a lot of money and this today and right now. And some of that might be true, but salespeople have some of the highest uh, stress levels, anxiety levels, job dissatisfaction. And those are part of the equation that no one ever talks about. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly agree with you there. We try to <clears throat> bring some light to those topics periodically and um, dispel the myth that it, that it's easy money, right? And, and the money doesn't come at a cost, right? It certainly comes at a cost, you know, where you're spending your time, health costs, physical health costs, mental health costs, um, time spent away from family, friends, all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, anybody who's been in sales long enough and has, um, you know, done it at a really high level has made sacrifices in one area of their life or another in order to, sh to achieve whatever modicum of success financially that they're out. And that's really only 20% of the people who sell. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the other 80% are just rotating around through yes. this whirlpool of very similar type jobs. Right. Yeah. 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 At leader bad companies and bad experiences. Yeah, yeah. So, Doc, Dr. Condi, we're, we're getting to the end of this, but, you know, one of the things we always ask people at the end is, you know, what can we do to help you? You know, you've been very gracious with your time and your knowledge. How can we support you, your efforts, and in, in the things that you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I think, first of all, is, is there a way for us to kind of bridge the gap between academia and industry? to really do some really cool experiments, research that could benefit academia, but also could also help influence the thinking of industry. Um, I try I, to- I mean, Scott and I can rattle off 10 CEOs who would be like, yeah, we'll do that. Like in a heartbeat. Yeah. yeah I'd be happy to I've, to people. I've tried to do this kind of thing before. So I would actually flip the question around a little bit, you know, because I've tried, I've reached out to professors and um, department heads and, and tried to say, hey, I'm a practitioner, right? I hire people all the time across, you know, the, the country and refer people here and there. Like, can I come in and speak? Is there anything I can participate in in terms of any research study? Or can I mentor students? Or, you know, I've, I've even tried to, like, donate hundreds of books to to a sales book that I've written to departments and whatnot. And I get met with like silence, right? So like me, I suck at prospecting into academia right now. I, this, this was a couple of years. This was like 2017 when I was trying to do this to be, to be fair. So maybe I've gotten better, but I, I, I failed miserably. So I would love to participate in that kind of, that kind of thing. Well, that's so our takeaways. We'll do that together. I mean, I, uh, I think again, a um, couple of things that set me apart is, A, I, I used to lead, you know, decent sized organizations. I took one from 60 to 100 million in three years. So I know, I know the, the, the job of a sales leader, right? I am one of only five Latino doctorate level sales professors in the United States. I think I'm the only full-time inside sales researcher in the world. Wow. Um, because I came from inside sales, and to me, that's sort of the, the current state and future of sales. So I have a different perspective on the value of partnering with industry, so I look forward yeah. to hopefully us doing that, uh, because I think it's a big, it's a big need that, that we help everyone get better in, in, this, in this game of, of, uh, of sales. Yeah. And of course, I'm always looking to, to learn and, and share my perspective with, with uh, individuals and companies, and my goal is to help people think differently. I love when people think differently because at the end of the day, if you want the same results, let's keep doing the same thing we've been done, doing for the last few years. Well, we are game, we are game to, to help, whether it's through direct contribution or introduction or what have you. Um, I would love to support that initiative. Yeah, and then, you know, we are, my MBA guys are at night. So generally the guests I've had in my universities have generally through Zoom. Because we teach them, I teach them seven to nine thirty on Thursday nights or Tuesday nights. It depends. And I've had guests come on Zoom and um, yeah. give people a different perspective. And I think it's important for my students to realize the old days of sell have changed tremendously, and they're changing every day. It's really fascinating how 
it has evolved so quickly in the last five to 10 years. Yeah, that's right. And then some of your students might look at like sales leaders and think of Richard Harris. And then all of a sudden I get on the screen and I look like a homeless person and they're like, wait, <laughs> that guy knows something about sales. And it might give hope to some of these college kids out there. Right? Thank, thank you for that backhand, Scott. I appreciate <laughs> that. But, but Dr. Condi, this, this would be interesting. Uh, so Scott, um, ever since this started, has been doing a, a Thursday night sales class on Zoom. Anybody could register. He had, he, and I'm not kidding, 100 people a week show up for this thing on Zoom. Oh, yeah. And they just pick a topic and talk about it. And maybe your class, you know, I know Scott would come in anyway. I would too. But maybe they want to see what it's like out there. Yeah. What are people actually talking about right now in the sales world? You know, turn, turn your students on to that because I, I think they'd enjoy it. Plus, yeah. they can have a cocktail while they do it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Plus, you know, our, our undergraduate, I think it's also important to help undergraduates. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about diversity in sales. There really isn't any. Um, but that's a different topic I, I can talk about all day. But how do we get more diversity? Because the reality is demographics are changing and we need to have the new wave of individuals in this country be interested in sales and, yeah. and be better at sales. Yeah. And um, I think that needs to be fixed. We should do that as, a, we'll do that as another, as a follow-up episode with you. Cause I think we've, we've run into that and talked to people, but it, it'd be, it'd be fun to hear it at the academic level as opposed to just sort of the emotional human level. Right, and they sort of combine the two. So, yeah. well, Dr. Condi, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, Super if, interesting. Yeah, I know you're on LinkedIn. Um, if people do want to get a hold of you or have questions about University of Houston downtown and your program, where where else can they reach out to you? Yeah, so I'm LinkedIn. Found on LinkedIn. I also have a website called InsideSalesGeek.com, and you can follow me on Twitter, Inside Sales Geek. I tweet some as much as I need to. I uh, sometimes I kind of struggle with saying stuff that just to say stuff and i feel a lot of people do that so that's the internal struggle i have uh, between providing value and just spouting off at the mouth i don't have any problem spouting off at the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that's true he does and of course of course i think i add value when i do that so yeah. you know so. <laughs> yeah i'm sure you do you do i've read your stuff yeah. <laughs> thank you Dr. thanks so much for joining us man Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you.